I'm Ro Roger Steenerson. I was uh, teaching high school in 1952. I was drafted, and because I had a physics degree, after a month of basic training, they sent me to the Army Chemical Center at Edgewood, Maryland. And after being there for about six weeks, Colonel Entwistle came and said, can you drive a truck? I said, well, I'm a farm boy from North Dakota, and I can drive most things. And he said, well, you have your physics degree, and you can drive a truck, so we want you to go with a group out to Nevada where they're testing atom bombs. <laughs> and that was Upshot Knothole, the spring of 1953. And our job was to put out machines like the size of a kitchen washing machine they would have trays in that could open and close the cover over them and collect fallout that would come after a detonation at three miles away, six miles away, nine miles away, first six hours, next 12 hours, next day, and take these samples from these trays and send back to Edgewood, Maryland to uh, see how radioactive they were Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, different kinds of radiation, but mostly radiation from fallout is X-rays, and he, we wanted X-rays, and don't know if they hurt us too much or not, but thousands of universities all over the world through the 30s and 40s would put animals in front of an X-ray machine, turn it on for 10 seconds, 20 seconds and see how much time it would take for an x-ray, continually x-raying to kill an animal. It's a grim thing to do, but they know quite a bit about it. And so today, as we sit here, we're being exposed to background radiation, x-rays. And a few of them kill cells as they go through, and we get rid of our dead cells, pretty much, some of them linger and become cancerous. The, um, my experience up at uh, the Proving Ground, Dugway and Frenchman's Flat and so forth, we would dose the meters and every evening we'd turn those in at the desk with our name on and they'd analyze it and maybe once a week we get a note, you've had so much radiation builds up. And uh, in that and also in the Pacific, uh, I was out at Castle in 54 when they did, I don't know if Bravo was over there or not, but so I saw Bravo from about 20 miles away detonate everybody on these, like, you were saying an atoll is about 20 little islands in a circle. And each island is about a block square. The main island at Bikini was maybe three blocks wide by a mile long. That's where most of the natives lived that we took off of there. Uh, and the other end of the atoll was a little bitty island that they blew up. And as you say, it uh, took the sand from 5,000 feet underneath and a few hundred feet down. But there are two, I collected a certain amount of radiation. And I'm 90 years old last July. Did it hurt me or not? I don't know. Maybe I'd live to be 110 if I hadn't had it. Maybe a little bit of extra radiation helps you. You've known people that have smoked for 40 years never had a bit of cancer. People smoke for five years and die of cancer. I don't know the answers, and I don't suppose anybody else does much either, but... Um, all right, talk a little bit about what's it like to watch the bomb test. Upshot not hold, I watched seven of them. We would go out during the week and put up our machines and then wait for Friday morning at dawn drive from Mercury up to a side hill on the side of 
Yucca Flat, and I suppose the closest one's five miles away, a tower shot, a tower shot maybe eight miles away the next week, and we'd sit up there or stand up there, put on our goggles, <coughs> you had a pair here. Yeah. Uh, like welding goggles. I'm a farm boy welder also, so I've done a lot of welding with uh, arc welding, and you wear them to save your eyes. Um, and it, it would be bright, but certainly you feel the heat on your face. Comes instantly, the heat does, or the speed of light. And then we'd wait for the blast to come. And at five miles, it takes about 30 seconds. And if we were standing, you'd knock us back a half a step. But this idea to knock you to the ground, uh, I watched seven of them. I never backed up more than half a step in any of them. Sitting on an easy chair like that, you made me back a little bit. But what was most fun about it, and you hate to use the word fun in something that extreme, was you could see the blast come across the desert. At 700 miles an hour, it's pretty fast, and especially the last mile, it comes up, uh, well, still only the speed of sound. Uh, but you can see it, and you can sort of almost see it coming, bang. Uh, after a while, we got a little bit more blasé, so after about the fifth test, we wouldn't put the strap on our goggles, we'd hold them in front of us, so you could sort of feel the heat and sort of almost peek around to see, so we could get a little better sense of watching the mushroom cloud rise. Um, the blast would hit us, and I would say up on the side hill there were maybe three, 400 people, mostly civilians. UCLA, uh, Masters, MIT, yep. Texas Instrument, um, and of course, Army, Navy, Air Force, everybody had their representatives there. Uh, I was a sort of representative of the Army, but my buddies were, we were all uh, corporals or whatever, uh, college graduates, te school teachers. Most of my friends went on to be uh, university teachers, University of Illinois, and so forth, uh, University of California. Um, I lived through it went back to teaching high school. And uh, my experience with, uh, I have stories to tell about the Pacific too, maybe tomorrow, um, are pretty positive because of the people I met. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your stories. I. I I admire every one of you that was involved in, in, in nuclear business. Uh, it took a whole entire family to make it tick. And uh, I can't thank enough of you for what you've done for our nation. I was sent out to the Dugway Proving Grounds, we called it then. I don't use that word yet anymore. I don't hear it much. Uh, in the spring of 53, do I have a copy for myself? <laughs> There you go. And the code name is called Upshot Knothole. And our job was to uh, set machines out that had trays on that it covers over the top of the tray would open up for a certain number of hours after a test to collect what would come out of the sky called fallout. And fallout particles are almost invisible, most of them, mostly microscopic. But every particle of fallout is an x-ray machine and gives off radiation. I think one should never use the word always or never or ever because I suppose there are exceptions. But basically, a particle of fallout is an x-ray machine and gives off x-rays. And somebody asked about the word downwind. Wind does not carry sun rays. And wind does not carry radiation that comes from the bomb, period. 
but wind carries fallout. So to be downwind from my test means from Annie, for example, was a device, I used the word device, put on top of a 300 foot tower, and on the morning of March 17th at 5.30, we'd spent the week before putting out our machines with trays to collect fallout different times and downwind to the up against Nellis Air Force Base to see what came that way because the tendency of the wind was to go that direction. After the morning of that morning, we'd go out and we'd put on our goggles and at 5.30, detonation occurred. We were standing on a side hill or sitting in chairs like this up there with a lot of other, mostly civilians um, from MIT, UCLA, most universities, uh, wa watching what happened. And at five miles or so, uh, with our goggles on, we could feel, we were surprised how quiet it was. Be a flash, but no sound, because the flash or the heat would hit our face, and it wasn't very hot at five miles. Uh, bright sunshine was almost as warm, as far as my friends and myself felt. Um, it was quiet, because the light comes, or the heat comes, the speed of light, basically instantaneously, but the, fl the blast would come at the speed of sound, 700 miles an hour, and maybe 40 seconds later, over half a minute, the blast would hit where we were standing and sitting, and at five, six miles, the blast would rock us back half a step, but didn't knock us to the ground, uh, basically no effect at all. Um, and again, our dosimeters would record no radiation from the bomb. Enough atmosphere in between here and there. We could feel the heat, and perhaps there were some gamma rays involved, but not much. Uh, don't drag on too long, but 300 foot tower shot. Oh, afterwards, then Colonel Ed Wessel and Dr. Mahoney and some of us went over to see what happened to the tower. It was vaporized down to concrete slab. Uh, the tower was basically uh, molecules in the air someplace. Um, it didn't dig into the ground there, uh, and that was a 18 kiloton, about the size of Hiroshima. Um, half a mile around, the cactus, mesquite, yucca uh, plants were pretty much gone. The, the roots, uh, sand left. A mile away, um, some stubs. A mile and a half, uh, scorched. At two miles, the plants were probably still uh, undamaged. Uh, that was our observations. But we knew there, too, that the heat up there close is two, three thousand degrees temperature, uh, which would scorch things. Uh, the, there are many different groups doing experiments. I don't know who built the houses. Um, somebody put up a railroad track with train segments on it to see if it would knock over locomotives. I, and I don't, don't remember whether it was Annie or Nancy or what shot, but um, we knew that the heat would be very fierce up close but the blast would come and blow out the fires that would start, pretty much. And so uh, some of us in our barracks, use the word barracks, it was, we slept in sort of tents, uh, double-coated tents, 
no mosquitoes. Uh, <laughs> cold in the night, but a little heater in there. Uh, Some have said, well, that's their own experiment. So uh, got down to about Badger, and we used a tower shot because we knew exactly where the tower was. And we went back. Well, let's go back to Nancy. We thought we'll do our own experiment. So we go a couple miles away and uh, put up a board and put tin foil on. And this would reflect the heat a little bit more than bare wood would. And so, uh, put a piece of wood out, up against a sandbag, and came out the morning after the test or the next day and looked around for our board. Most of them are a little ways. We'll try it again the next day or a little better, a little more sandbags and whatever. And so mine turned out this way. This is, I think, from the 300 foot tower shot called Simon, 43 kiloton, about twice as big as Hiroshima or more, on the morning of um, April 25th, 53. He talked about a um, airdrop, and I didn't hear too well, and my hearing isn't good, but they dropped the bomb down, and then you, you jumped into that area where they dropped the bomb. Is that what I understood? They dropped an air bomb, I mean, a, a test from an airplane, and, and then after, how many hours after the drop did they drop you in from an air parachute? Within an hour. Within an hour, okay. 45 minutes, maybe? Encore was a um, drop from, I think, a B-29, and it was fun to watch. It came over from Ellis Air Base, looped around up there at about 30,000 feet, 25,000 feet, with a racetrack type thing, maybe two, three miles long. It looped around about two, three times so they could pinpoint the bombardier. On the desert floor, it put a bullseye with blacktop, mm -hmm. pavement type, maybe half a mile across as the bullseye. And in the center of that, a blob about as big as this room at the pinpoint, and they aimed at that, but from five miles up to drop, and it was a parachute drop because we could watch from the side hill, and uh, again, by that time, we were blasé. Nobody ever strapped on these things anymore. You'd hold them to the side a little bit. You'd shade your eyes. Or you can go out and look at the sun, but you have something in between me, you look around a little bit. And we watched the parachutes come down. And it was a countdown, of course. And at 4,000 feet, it was detonated. And that's quite a ways in the air. Uh, and as far as our job was from the chemical center, zero, zero fallout. This didn't cause uh, any dust or anything to be radiated, and so the fallout from Encore was insignificant. Grable was an artillery shell shot. For a week or 10 days, they practiced, and maybe your book tells you how far away the uh, artillery was. They lobbed this artillery shell, and we could see where it landed. And at home in Minnesota, I have a couple of three pieces of shrapnel, shrapnel from artillery shells that were lobbed in without any bomb in the middle of them. And then on 8.30 in the morning on May 25th of May, uh, well, it says four or five miles away, they lobbed this artillery shell. And it detonated uh, 500 feet above the ground and uh, there's no shrapnel left on that one. That was vaporized, of course. Um, 
Well, that's my first story. Uh, just to help you out, ladies and gentlemen, the, from the time where the device, I mean, I should say the cannon, until it was lobbed down the field about six and a half miles, like he said, it detonated at 524 feet above the, the surface of the ground. Thank you very much. Well, then, the second story. Um, this, except you back me up, could be all made, made up. Uh, I, anybody could write something like this. But this is a fact sheet. Um, Bikini Atoll. Again, I think it was explained to you that atolls are a series of islands in a okay. circle. And 10 miles up and down, just as close to the moon, perhaps 15 miles from left to right. And there's a little X in the upper left corner by a little island called Nam. You can't play that X by something else to do. They call it a sand spit. And a sand spit was about the size of half a city block by half a city block. Um, and that's where Bravo was detonated. The code name for this series was 1954, Castle. And the Army Chemical Center again sent about the same group dozen of us out again to collect fallout. So in February, January, we went out and started paying out our machines and looking at the map, our base was at the bottom of your map where you have the island called Uncle, and you see four little islands near there. Each of these islands is about the size of a city block. They're a little bit bigger. Uh, certainly, Uncle was maybe half a mile by two blocks wide. The other four islands were connected with sand and coral, and a pretty good runway for airplanes was built on those. Uh, and you mentioned biblical things. On Obo, the very far right island, was the chapel. And I still remember walking over there with some of my buddies for Protestant chapel. I know they had mass there pretty much every day. Uh, and Protestants probably only had service on Sundays. Um, wonderful food. I have slips here from, and it's almost worth reading, our menu for 10th of April, broiled tenderloin steaks for dinner, strawberry shortcake. Uh, <laughs> Sunday noon, assorted cold cuts, fruit salad, Sunday evening, romaine salad, prime rib of beef, ice cream, and orange cake. Uh, you might be interested, list of the low tide of 012, I don't know what it means, and 12 hours later, 1846. Temperature stayed about the same for six months, night or day. You also get the temperature of the surf. This was all military radio and uh, sort of blah, 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 like listening to a police <coughs> dispatch. Um, oh, the Coral Pit, or the Coral Bowl, was the movie theater, like these chairs here, the screen up here out in the open. You could hear the <coughs> surf outside of the, in the ocean surf. And we'd sit there at twilight, early morning, and what's a flying fish? Flying fish don't fly. 
flying fish or fish that swim fast enough in the water when they come out of a breaker, they put out their wings and they float until they go in again. Um, <coughs> but in spite of the surf roaring, we could hear the movie pretty well. And on the 10th of April, 54, at the Coral Bowl with the movie, Jean Nelson and Virginia Mayo starred in She's Back on Broadway. Um, all right, where was I here? Oh, yes. Fact sheet. Bravo, we prepared for it by putting our machines on, you see where the X was again, up by NARM, and almost all of our work was done by helicopter, and out in the middle of the gun with, uh, I don't know what they'd call them, not landing craft, but barges, we'd pull out there, and put our, in, our machines on, and then anchor them to the bottom of the lagoon, only three, 400 feet down. Um, over on the right upper corner is the basic island of Bikini Atoll, and that's where most of the inhabitants lived there until we moved them off uh, in 53 or four just before this. So we had our machines to collect fallout on almost the major islands and about five out in the lagoon. Uh, and as far close to X was maybe that L in the middle of the page, the first letter of lagoon. All right, Bravo. They collected every human being on all the islands. Uh, from any military, civilian, and natives, like I said, long gone, except maybe some stayed on to work. Um, and we got on ships. I was on a little aircraft carrier. I think it was called the flagship. And during the night, we sailed about 10, 15 miles out of the lagoon. And at, um, what time in the morning does it say? Well, it doesn't say. I can't but tell you either. Again, as far as they explained to us, we could use this if we wanted to or not, even though it was going to be a big shot. The curvature of the earth, along with 100% humidity, uh, light, it's just going to penetrate very much, or heat. And so when it went off, there was a countdown on the ship's loudspeakers. And when the time came down to zero, the sky lighted up. No heat, just quietness. Because it, we were 20 miles away, 100% humidity, the, the mist, the roar of the ocean. Uh, but it was a very bright sky, and the fireball lasted for, I would say, 30 seconds. It was a long time to be warm out there. Um, where the ones in Nevada, the fireball was only hot enough to keep our faces warm for five, 10 seconds, start to cool off right away, and 20 seconds so we could take these away. Um, As explained yesterday, Bravo was bigger than they expected. They expected 15 megaton. Uh, kiloton means 1,000 ton. Megaton means million ton. Uh, it damaged everything, anything. So after Bravo, nobody could go back to do anything here for more than a few minutes. So 
for the next test uh, called Romeo. We watched it from a ways away, but not from any of the islands because we were on ships for these other tests. But finally, uh, Colonel was asked for anybody volunteer to go in and pick up some samples. And so Hamilton and myself said, we'll volunteer. We didn't have families at home. We had parents, of course, and, but no, we weren't married. And so up at the top, you see the little island called Fox. We'd put a machine on Fox to collect samples and the trays uh, had done their thing. And so a helicopter took Hamilton and myself over and we dropped a Geiger counter down on the sand to uh, see how hot it was, which means how radioactive is it, and radioed back to uh, Entwistle, our colonel, and he said, uh, give you three minutes to win it off, and if you're in there more than three minutes, it's gonna be harmful to your health. Even two minutes may be a little bit harmful, but if you're there for 10 minutes, you may as well not come back because you won't live through it. You might live for a few months, but... Uh, so, helicopter took Hamilton and myself over, put us down on the beach with a backup helicopter out about a quarter of a mile hovering there because if anything happened, he would come and take Hamilton and myself and the other pilot away. And we land on the beach. It was covered with maybe several thousand turns at the bird, uh, dead. Some of them with their feathers burned off pretty much. Most of them with their head on the ground, maybe blood coming out of their eyes from, they'd been there for a couple of days the radiation was fierce. It uh, pretty much killed them. They were going to die. Thousands of dead fish floating on the shallow part of the beach. Um, but we jogged in, picked up 10 trays each, jogged back to the helicopter, took us off, took us back to the aircraft carrier, took our clothes off, uh, our boots, took a shower, and uh, Hamilton's still living in Illinois, taught the University of Illinois for until five, 10 years ago, I don't know how long, maybe 20 years ago, time goes on. Um, I'm 90 years old. I don't know if it hurt me or not. Um, most of the others have passed away, but basically old age. Um, I feel bad for people that develop cancer because of too much radiation. Uh, you go to the dentist, maybe we have too much, too many x-rays there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All right, those are my two stories. Anybody questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm. You're welcome. <laughs> there you go. Well, as he uh, mentioned to you, I, I want to add to it just a little bit. Bravo was, uh, you know, at Bikini Island. My memory serves me, and maybe he can correct me, but I believe it was on Inu. And this is where Dr. Tiller had put fission and fusion together. And uh, he thought it was going to be 8.8 .8 megatons. I wasn't there at the time it was fired. I didn't get there until 1957, and this happens in 525-1953. But I would like to point out to you that uh, the device that, was, that he's been talking about, particularly Bravo, after it was fired, it vaporized the entire island 
It left a crater 6,020 feet wide, and it vaporized the, the reef 240 feet deep. And uh, that's the largest uh, uh, nuclear test that we've ever conducted. August uh, 1961, uh, Russia fired 52 megatons at Novo Zembo. And uh, it just so happened that uh, in 1991 or 92, uh, when the Russians came to the test site, I was involved as a senior verification representative between the two countries. Mr. Boris came in. And nat naturally, you know, when as the Russians come in um, through the appropriate officials, I usually got something to read, kind of some what they may have been involved in. <clears throat> so Mr. Boris, uh, one evening I was, I always, always sat, I slept in the same area as they did, even though it was in a fenced area with a security guard in. So one night I, I asked Mr. Boris, I said, uh, just how far away were you when you did this 52 megaton? And he said, well, I was in the vicinity of about 40 miles. And I said, what kind of a wave of water did you get? And he said, in excess 18 feet wall of water. And I can understand that. Uh, I've been at Anna Talk many years after these gentlemen have been there. Uh, I spent uh, 19, uh, December 1955 to January 58 out in the islands. And I've been through a number of those uh, events. Of course, I have to admit, I did not uh, witness as large as he has. The largest I've ever witnessed, 10.9 megatons. That'll leave a fireball in excess of three and a half miles. When the Russians fired uh, their shot in uh, 1961, that left a fireball in excess of five and a half miles wide. 